So, you guys got some experimental data. You were measuring the voltage across a capacitor. Let me turn this music down a little bit. That's probably a little loud. That's better. So you were measuring the voltage across a capacitor in an RLC circuit. Well, at least that's what we finished with, an RLC circuit. So I'm going to put a plot of the capacitor voltage versus time. E.T. Cornell, how should we present the plots as it is hard to see all th three lines for some plots? I'll come back to that too. So for the RLC circuit, you should see a response that looks something like this. The voltage across the capacitor shoots up and then it goes back down and kind of slowly decays towards this steady state value, which the steady state value should be one volt because we applied a one volt source and so the capacitor is going to charge up to one volt as well. Okay, so actually this uh, derived ship, I'm going to go to your question first, which was how do we find omega D from the experimental data versus theoretical? So let's do experimental first. Derived ship had another question. I know it's typically standard to plot to four tau. For the RLC circuit, do we need to plot to the same limit? I think that's a good idea. I mean, I've gotten a couple questions over how should we zoom in on the plot? Like, you know, if you just plot your raw data, maybe I'll do that like off to the side. If you just plot your raw data by itself, you're going to have the voltage at zero before you turn on the circuit. And then you have like a really quick response that happens like there. And then you have um, the steady state value, one volt. And it looks like this. It's like really zoomed out and it's hard to tell what's going on. And so in your lab report, you want to zoom in tight. Uh, you want to get in kind of like this region. So in MATLAB, you can use the zoom tool and like click a box around the relevant data. And like when you zoom in on that portion, it's going to look something like this. And this right here is kind of the range that you want to see in the lab report. You want to see the response starting down here at zero and then going up to its steady state value. Like that's the, that's a typical thing. And as far as like how much time, so derived ship, I think that's a great idea. Like you go out to four time constants, which is the settling time of the system. That's kind of what I drew here. Like the system is basically settling at this point. Um, I think that's a good distance to plot out to. That's a great question. So, from this plot, you are trying to get a couple things. Uh, like number one, we want the damping ratio. You're going to use the logarithmic decrement method to get that, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, you also want the natural frequency, omega n. You want the damped natural frequency, omega d. And those are the three main things. So how about we first do omega d this is the damped natural frequency the damped natural frequency is the frequency of oscillation that you see in this plot um so what is a period of oscillation a period is the length of time it takes to complete one cycle so, like, let's say the beginning of one cycle, as we define it, is like the top of this peak. So one period is the time it takes to get from the top of this peak and then get back to the same point in the cycle. So this time distance here, 
is a period of oscillation. And um, often I like to use the variable capital T. And sometimes you'll even see a subscript D on there. And that indicates damped. Like this is the damped period of oscillation. So when a system is damped, it has these decaying oscillations. So we would say this system is damped. Okay, so if you want to get the damped natural frequency, the first thing that you want to do is get the damped period. So this is a way to do it. Find that like peak to peak distance. And actually, we'll do that in an example in MATLAB in a second. So we'll like get some concrete numbers, but here's the concept. So once you get the period, the frequency of these oscillations, let's call it FD. If you do it in units of cycles per second, which is hertz, you would do one divided by the damped period. So this is in units of cycles per second. Cycles per second is the same as hertz. When you see hertz, that just means how many cycles per second. So if it takes you know, half a second to complete a cycle. Well, that means we would complete two cycles in one second. So the frequency would be two hertz. Um, FD here, this is different than omega D. So omega D is the damped natural frequency in radians per second. How many radians are in a cycle? For those of you in chat, if you're brave, if you if you have a keyboard in front of you, how many how many radians are in a cycle? Uh, yes, two pi. So, if I want to convert this into omega d, let's say I have like two cycles per second. Well, each cycle has two pi radians, so I multiply it by two pi. So it's you take two pi times the um, damped frequency in hertz. So omega d, this, this is what you want to do. You find the period, then you get the, the frequency from that, and to convert it into radians per second, you multiply that frequency by 2 pi. So getting the experimental damped natural frequency, it's, it's as simple as that. If you want to be fancy, and get a better estimate, what you can do, instead of just looking at one period, you could count out like a couple periods. So like, let's say that I start here, but instead of just going to one period, I go out to, to two periods, maybe I even go out to three periods, and you can go further than that. And so you could say that to kind of average this, you could say the damped period is this longer time duration that went out three periods. Maybe I'll call that time, I gotta make up a variable for it. We'll just call it X. Let, let's say the amount of time for three cycles to complete. So I could say it's like X divided by three. You know what I mean? Or you could go out like 10 periods if your data looks good. And what this does is it, it creates like an averaging effect. Like whenever you're doing an experiment, like if you just zoom in on one period, it's not going to be perfect. But if you kind of extend it out and average, you're going to get a better estimate. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, okay, so that's, does that answer your question derived ship? at least for the experimental. Let's, okay, great, great, great. Let's talk about the damping ratio. So this is the damping ratio, this nasty squiggly symbol that's hard to draw. The bigger the damping ratio is, the more quickly your oscillations decay. Um, so maybe it only takes like one cycle before all these oscillations flatten out or 
whatever. You know, if you increase the damping ratio, they die out faster. So from a graph like this, you can estimate what the damping ratio is using a couple techniques, but a really good technique is the logarithmic decrement. So the way this works is you want to first identify the steady state value that your response is approaching. So like for you, the steady state value, well, I mentioned it earlier, like the capacitor is charging up to one volt or the voltage is approaching one volt. So um, you identify that steady state value. And then for each peak or for a couple peaks, you want to identify the overshoot. So that is the amount that the signal exceeds the steady state value. So um, like at the first peak, I'm going to make up something. So I know this line is at one volt. And this looks like maybe it, it peaked at like 1.5 volts or something. So the overshoot for that first peak is 0 0.5 volts. And um, maybe you identify the overshoot for a couple other peaks as well. So just eyeballing it, maybe this is 1.2. Maybe that's the peak there. So the overshoot would be the difference between that 1.2 and the steady state value. So that's 0 0.2 volts. And then you can do this for like these successive peaks and it gets harder when they get, you know, really close to the steady state value. But in MATLAB, you know, you could zoom in and um, what you want to do is calculate a factor delta. So let me give you the definition for delta. First I'll just write it out and then I'll tell you what each of these terms mean. So it's 1 over n times the natural log of the overshoot at peak, let's call it k, uh, divided by the overshoot at some peak in periods later. Can you use the negative peak overshoot values as well? Ooh, good question. You could. You actually could. Um, but I'll point out something in a second. You just have to be a little careful. So, okay, the overshoot, I've kind of defined what that is. You just calculate at a given peak how much it exceeded the steady state value. Um, a common mistake is that people plug in the peak value itself for the overshoot, but that's not what you want. Like what I mean is some people would plug in 1.5. Well, that's the amplitude of the peak, but that's not the overshoot. The overshoot is how much it, it exceeded the steady state value. So let's say we do the first peak. I would put, plug in 0.5. All right. So n here represents the number of periods later that you're going to compare another peak. So like uh, let's 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 do an example. Um, let's say I want to compare this overshoot to the overshoot two periods later. So one period would be going over to the next peak. Going over two periods would be the peak after that. And let's just make up something for that. Let's say this is 1.1. So the peak amplitude is 1.1. The steady state value is 1, so let's say the overshoot is just 0.1 volts. All right, so in this formula, let's say I'm looking at the peak two cycles later. And then I take the overshoot from that peak two cycles later, which is 0.1. And then I would calculate this. So 1 half times the natural log of 0.5 divided by 0.1, which would just be 5. 
All right, so this is the first step. You calculate delta. So then you can get the damping ratio, which depends on delta. So the damping ratio is 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus 2 pi divided by delta squared. And that's going to give you the damping ratio. How about... How about, how about we do this with some actual numbers in MATLAB just to show this off? Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pull up a plot. So I made this plot in advance. It's not representative of your actual data. Well, I mean, it's it's close enough so I let's let's imagine this is my capacitor voltage you can see that the oscillations are approaching a steady state value of one and I have time on the horizontal axis and uh, this is times 10 to the minus 3 so this is milliseconds here so one well actually we can see right here the time it takes to complete one cycle here we start at the bottom um, it took one millisecond and we see this consistently is is following. So I mean, in your and this is a little cleaner than than maybe yours looks. In fact, I'm sure that's the case. But you could like click on these individual points, and I see that the time value. So this is probably too small for you to see on your screen, but the x value is 0. 0.0005. So 0.5 milliseconds is when that peak occurred. And then here, this peak happened at 0 0.0015, so 1.5 milliseconds. So what you could do in your code is you could just subtract these time values, get an estimate for your period. And like I said, if you want to get fancy and get even more precise, you could get a couple of these peaks Let's see, like maybe down here, that's how many periods later? One, two, three, four. That's four periods later. I could take the difference in these values, divide it by the number of cycles, and that would be like an averaged estimate of the period. Okay, so for us, let's just go into our code. I'm going to say the damped period is one millisecond, but let's keep this in like seconds. So that's 0 0.001 seconds. Damped period in seconds. So what I like to do next is I get the frequency in Hertz. So this is the damped natural frequency in Hertz. But then if you want omega D, remember that's two times pi times FD. So let's run this. So omega D, ooh, what is this, 6,000 radians per second. So that's omega D. And that's how you get your experimental omega D. You would, you would kind of do this. Now let's go back and... Um, Let's get the damping ratio using logarithmic decrement. So what I'm going to do, I kind of already identified all these peaks. I'm going to make like a vector of overshoot values. So like the very first one, the Y value is 1.7. And actually, I'm going to fill this vector with like all of these overshoot values. So we'll say 1.7. And then the next one is... 1.343. Ooh, I'm already making the mistake. I have to subtract the steady state value from this. So the peak was at 1.7, but I subtract the steady state value, and that's how much I actually overshot. 1.7 minus 1. The next peak is at 1.343. So I do that. Let's do a couple more. 1.168. And we'll keep going. 
eight two. And let's just do one more. 1.040. Okay, so these are the overshoots for the first one, two, three, four, five peaks. Um, now what you need to do is you need to calculate delta, which remember the formula is one divided by the number of periods in between the peaks that I'm gonna compare. So how about we just do, um, Let's try a couple different ones. Let's compare the first peak to this third peak. So that means that two periods passed between the first and the third peak. One period, two periods. So n is equal to two. So I'll say one divided by two, let's just call it 0.5, times the natural log, which is just log in MATLAB. If you just do log, it'll automatically be the natural log. And we do the overshoot at that first peak divided by the overshoot at the third. And this is going to give us our delta value. And then to get the damping ratio from that, I take 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus 2 times pi divided by delta, and I square that whole thing. Or I square the 2 times pi divided by delta square root of one plus that one divided by that let's let's run this so delta was 0 0.71 and my damping ratio estimate is 0 0.112 so depending on which peaks you choose you should get something slightly different so let's remember this one um, but let's compare I don't know. Let's compare the last peak to the first peak. Let's see if we get the same thing. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's just make a different one. I'll call this delta one, two, three. So there's four periods between the first and fifth peak. So I'll just call like four to be like the number that I used. So I take one divided by the number of periods in between. So between peak one and peak five, there's four periods. Count them, one, two, three, four periods. And, uh, oh, I gotta update this variable. I call it delta four. So let's calculate this. Let's see if zeta is the same or if it's a little different. Okay, 0.1132 compared to 0.1128. So in yours, Depending on how many peaks you take in between, you should still get something pretty consistent. Somebody asked, who was it? M.H. Abedin. If you can use the negative peaks, you could. Um, so it would work the same way. Let's see. You take this one, this one this one if you want to get fancy you i mean you could and but you would compare negative peaks to negative peaks well really i would um it'll give you the same deal what you could do for this first peak so why is it 0.51 but you have to find the difference between that and the Oh, it was Penguin who asked. <laughs> so I, I got it wrong. Um, but you have to find this difference here. And then basically you could take the absolute value of that difference. And um, same thing. You'll get, you'll get the same deal. So that is the damping ratio. Let's see... Were there other questions that I'm forgetting about? So that's damping ratio. That's, oh, how do you get the, so uh, this is how we, we, so we got omega D. That's the damped natural frequency in radians per second. Uh, here's a damping ratio. 
Okay, another question. When we plot the theoretical response, do we use omega D damping ratio, et cetera, for the experimental values? Ah, okay. So let's go over here. What I have you do in the lab report is compare theoretical response to experimental. So what I mean by the experimental response, this is just your measured data. The theoretical response, let me, let me pull up Let me pull up the lab manual real quick. Let's go over here. Okay. So, let's say that I want the theoretical response of the voltage. This is the theoretical response. Now, here you see this damping ratio term show up. You see natural frequency, you see damped natural frequency. These values are not the values from the graph that we just got. When you're doing the theoretical response, you want to find the theoretical of values of these, which don't come from an experiment. They come from um, the equations of the dynamics for this system. So let's see if I have an expression for this. Ah. To get the theoretical values of these, you want to use these equations. So, like given a resistance and an inductance, this should be the theoretical product of the damping ratio times natural frequency. So it's like, I don't have to run an experiment or anything, just given, given that I know what the inductance and the resistance is, I should have this relationship. Same thing with the damped natural frequency. So you know your L, your C, your R, and your L for the system because you measured it with the LCR meter. So without running any experiment other than like knowing what R, L, and C is, you should be able to predict a theoretical um, response of these. So. I realize this doesn't just directly give you the damping ratio and natural frequency. You have to solve these equations together. And there's there's a couple ways to do this, actually. Um, wait, let's go back here really quick. So you have two relationships. Let's call this equation one. And then you have equation two. Oh, this is kind of long. Let's call it equation two. Okay, so the first thing, and actually I was going to point this out earlier. There is a relationship between the damped natural frequency and the damping ratio and natural frequency. So the relationship is this. Omega D is your natural frequency times the square root of one minus the damping ratio squared. So really, I could rewrite this second equation. So I'm just going to erase this. And I'm going to replace it with omega n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So we have two equations, two unknowns. So what you can do, you can solve for damping ratio, natural frequency. You guys can do this. And these are going to be the theoretical values. So I didn't get these from the graph. I didn't get these from the experimental results. I only got it from the, the values of R, L, and C. So you solve these two equations. You get this. 
And then you plug those theoretical values into this, you know. So this is the underdamped equation. So we, we have different equations depending on which case it is. Like for the critically damped, this is the theoretical response and so on. Um, does that, oh, derived ship. If we used an equation from MAE 340, is that okay? That is, that is okay. You don't have to use the way that I just showed, but y you should be using the same idea that um, you're just getting those values from R, L, and C. That's what I mean by the theoretical values. O. Amarin says, should the theoretical VC settle like the experimental VC does? Yes. Yes. So um, when you're plotting your theoretical versus experimental, you're going to find that they are really, really, really close. Like they're going to be right on top of each other. If this is your measured one, oh, it doesn't look very good, does it? Your experimental one, I mean your theory, what I'm saying is like, they should be like right on top of each other like this. If when you plot your theory and your experiment and they don't look like that, something is wrong. There's a couple common mistakes. Um, some of them are a little tricky. Uh, so like if you find that yours aren't matching up, well, first of all, first of all, first of all, you need to line up when these graphs start. So like if you're plotting and they're just shifted, you should shift this one over so that they're on top of each other. Okay, so I'm assuming that you make this adjustment to your time vectors so that these are lined up. Now, once you have this lined up, if they still have differences, um, a couple things to check. Um, yeah, I mean, I would check R, L, and C. Is Ohio real? I think so. Uh, drive ship, should they line up the entire way? For my lines, the first two cycles are perfectly overlapped, but on the later ones, they start to separate slightly. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. And that is okay. Like I think I think what the experimental tends to do is so let's say I'm drawing it in pink actually. Your experimental I think it'll line up with theory really good and then it starts to like lag a little bit. Something like this. It starts to do a little bit of that. Um and that's that's normal. I'm trying to remember because I know I've thought through this before, like explaining why that happens. But essentially what's happening is the the period of oscillation is increasing a little bit. Um, or the the frequency of oscillation is slowing down. It's not oscillating as fast as it did at the beginning. So I think uh, that happens if the damping ratio is increasing. So I think like physically what's happening somehow is that the damping in the system has slightly increased during the response. And so the question is like, why is the damping increasing? I don't have a great answer off the top of my head, but that'd be really interesting to look up. I don't know if it's like there's a little bit of heat in the circuit from the current running through because heat increases resistance, which increases damping. So maybe that's an explanation, but I don't know if it's the whole story. <laughs> 
but in short yeah you see you see a little bit of difference and that's fine like it'll line up real nice at first and then it'll kind of separate um oh yeah th but i wanted to say like there's another thing that happens remember in the uh in the first experiment with the rc circuit we had a sampling frequency of 10,000 hertz, 10 kilohertz. But when you went to the RLC experiment, we increased the sampling frequency, I believe, to 25,000 hertz. So when you're plotting in MATLAB, based on this sampling frequency you make your time vector you know like in this case there's one sample every ten thousandth of a second and then up to whatever your final time is maybe you're plotting to the settling time of the system um, so in MATLAB you're making a time vector like this right when you go to the RLC make sure that you update this time vector. Maybe you even call it TRLC because now the DT is 1 over 25,000. And there's going to be a different, like, settling time. Whoa. But my point is, like, sometimes I've noticed it's a common mistake for students to forget to update the time vector. And so you plot the data against a different time vector and it makes your data look like all stretched out or compressed, depending on which mistake you made. So if you see something like that, like it's like way off, you might just have to update the time vector. Um, let's see, I'm looking at questions in the chat. I think we, I think I answered all the ones that I've seen so far. What other questions? Any other questions out there? Stuff you've run into? Let's see. I'm kind of scrolling through too to see if I can think of something else. But I'll definitely give priority to whatever questions you have. This is the this is a fantastic time to ask. Da, da, da. Yep, you gotta align align these vectors. Get that time vector right. Did you guys get the time constant okay? Did the error fraction method work out for you? We have another video that I posted on the error fraction method. You can go back to that. Get all the deets. But you should see nice agreement between the theoretical and the experimental time constant for sure. Yep. This is what I was saying before. Make sure you update your time vector to reflect the new sampling frequency. Damping ratio, we talked about that. Our error fraction method is less accurate than inspection because we zoomed in very close. Wait, how could the error fraction be less accurate, though? What? Wait, how do you... Um, or how are you even evaluating which one is more accurate? You know what I mean? Are you saying, like, it's more accurate if it's closer to the theoretical? Okay. But here, here's the thing. Let me, and this might turn it around for you. What you measured, that's real life. And the theoretical response, that's an abstraction of real life. So what I'm trying to point out is 
what you measured, that's whatever time constant that measured signal has, that's the time constant of the real system. The theoretical time constant, that's not necessarily, actually, that's not the true time constant, you know, because the theory is based on a model, which the model captures the real life behavior really well, but it doesn't capture everything. So I wouldn't say one is more accurate than another based on the comparison to the theoretical. I would say the one that's more accurate is because um, the definition of the time. Wait, so the error is in the theoretical then, not in the data collected? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, that you could have an error in your experimental analysis, like when you're actually calculating the time constant, but that's measured signal that you're analyzing. That's real life. The theory is the abstraction. So if you find a difference between the measurement and the theory, it's the theory that's off. But if you want to say which one is better, um, the definition of the time constant is the time it takes for the signal to get 63.2% closer to the final value, I think. So you could say based on your time constants, like which one actually suits that definition better? I think you'll find that the logarithmic decrement method gives you the best. That's what I anticipate. Or I was saying logarithmic decrement, I meant error fraction. Yeah. No, I like, uh, in my mind, the point of this lab is to show, well, I mean, it's to practice getting some of these values from a measured response. But I think bigger picture, it shows that um, at least for electrical systems, the equations we have to describe those systems are pretty darn accurate. Like, um, yeah, this differential equation for an RLC circuit, that really accurately describes real RLC circuits. And when you actually measure the voltage at different points in that circuit, you're going to see it agrees with this. There's a, there's a quote that I like to share, which is that, all mathematical models are wrong, but some are useful. So, like, even in this, you're going to see that there's some small disagreement between what this model predicts and what you actually measured. But this model is very, very good. In practice, it's hard to get a model that's this good for a real-life system. So, I mean, this is a relatively simple system. It's just a couple circuit components. You can get a good model for that. Um, a lot of stuff you're going to run into in practice. Whew, it's hard to get a good model. But it's really cool to see that these differential equations do um, capture real-life behavior that you can sense, touch, and measure. I think it's pretty cool.